All right, so in this video, I'm gonna be going through the five fundamental cold email deliverability practices that we installed at our agency to ensure that our clients get the best inbox placement. We currently manage over 2000 inboxes. And when it comes to deliverability, you know, it's not really black and white. It has a lot of technical nuances, but overall you need to keep in the back of your mind that you want your email behavior to be in line with the regular user and be primed to get more responses. And if you can do that, you're not gonna really have to worry about email deliverability. And so I'm going to walk you through how we go about managing our clients campaigns and ensuring that we have great deliverability. So it all starts off with the domain setup. We never want to use the primary domain to send cold emails out of because it's not a matter of if the deliverability is going to get bad. It's a matter of when is it going to get bad, right? And so to protect your primary domain, you want to set up a secondary domain that you use solely for the purpose of cold emailing. And I, I recommend that you only buy dot coms and that you don't include numbers or hyphens inside of your domain name. You know, there's a, an infinite amount of variations that you can create that are similar to your primary domain. So if your domain name is leapbird.com, you can get domains like getleapbird.com, tryleapbird.com, leapbirdsolutions.com. There's an infinite amount of variations, so that's how you should go about choosing your secondary domain name. And then you need to make sure that the DNS records are properly set up. So this is where I see a lot of people mess up when it comes to cold emailing. You simply type it on Google how to set up my DNS records properly for, and then you put the email provider that you're using, Google inboxes or Microsoft Office inboxes. You're gonna find a ton of guides. And then once you follow those guides, you simply need to use MX Toolbox to see if your DNS is properly set up. It'll tell you which records are not there. You need to go in and fix those. And it's usually the DMARC or the DKIM records that you're missing. And then where I see a lot of people mess up as well is that they, think that they set up the domain forwarding properly, but it's actually not working. And so you need to confirm that your redirect is working properly on your secondary domain. So if someone types in, you know, leapersolutions.com, it redirects to the primary domain of leaper.io, right? That is very essential because think about it. If you're sending a cold email and your recipient looks up your domain and it goes to a blank page, it's just going to look very sketch. And you want it to redirect to your primary website. So that's everything that you need to make sure on the domain side so that you're well protected when it comes to email deliverability. So now let's talk about list scraping and how you need to go about that. So, you know, it doesn't matter what database you use, whether it's Apollo, whether it's ZoomInfo, wherever it comes from, you need to always clean your list with an SMTP validation provider and only send to the valid emails. So a lot of databases, Apollo, ZoomInfo, they'll, when you export the emails, they'll say export valids only. Never trust that. It will lead to a horrendous bounce rate. You always want to do some level of third party, third party validation. And so I recommend using Neverbalance or Million Verifier. Those are great tools and only sending to the ballots. And then what you want to do is take the catch alls and throw it into Scrubby because Scrubby is the only tool in the market that can validate catch alls. And it's a tool that we own and it will validate it. And you then want to take those ballots and throw them back into the campaign that you're running. And so you need to use a third party validation tool. And when it comes to your lead list, you know, only email business emails. Try not to email personal emails. I've seen that personal emails have a much stronger personal, or not personal, but a much stronger spam filter. And then you want to avoid generic emails. And the reason why you want to avoid generic emails like info, support, sales, is you're probably not going to get a great response rate. And like I said in the beginning, you want to make sure that you are priming your campaigns to get as many responses as possible. And info, support, sales, they're usually not checked and they're probably not going to respond to your emails. And then when it comes to your lead list, you need to make sure that it's formatted properly so that, you know, everything is cleaned up. You know, you want to make sure the emojis are removed from the names, that the the, the company names are strictly the company names, what, what you would say rather. So a great example here is like, instead of saying Leadbird LLC, just saying Leadbird. And the reason why is once again, you want to prime everything to get a great response. And you're more likely to get a response to, I saw that you're working at Leadbird versus something that looks like automated and you know just pulled from the internet, like I saw that you're working at Leadbird LLC. So this is something that is massive when it comes to actual campaign performance. Now let's talk about warming up your inboxes. So this is pretty relatively new. It's you know warm up inbox or warming up your inboxes was probably made less than two years ago. So what we've seen from warming up our inboxes, you wanna make sure that the warm up is active at all times. You can use tools like Smart Lead or Instantly Personally, I think those two have the greatest warm-up network in the market currently. And the reason why is because it's they have tons of users that have hundreds of inboxes uh, across multiple different providers and overall has, has been a great experience using both of them. So 
I would use one of these tools to warm up your inbox and warming up your inbox is basically just throwing your email into an engagement group. And so your email is gonna automatically send emails to other people in their network and engage with them. Those in inboxes are gonna be trained to reply to your emails and mark them as unspam. So you basically just show up Google and Microsoft like, hey, my emails are actually getting responses. They're actually getting marked as unspam if they are going to the spam folder and so many things of that sort. So you wanna make sure that your warm up is on at all times. And most warm-up tools give you a warm-up score. I would take that score with a grain of salt. It's not the greatest indication of inbox health. You want to just use it as a baseline metric. I've seen on both of these tools where, you know, I might have had a 90 or 95% on the health score, but in reality, I knew my inbox placement wasn't well. And I'll show you how to track and, and, and score your inbox placement. When it comes to warm-up limits, you know, the warm-up emails are counted towards your daily quota of total emails because they are emails that are going out, right? So you want to aim for a one-to-one -one match, and that's what I prefer when it comes to cold emails. And so you want to have you know one-to-one -one match when it comes to warm and cold emails, and keep your total sending volume below sixty emails per inbox. So in that scenario, you know you're sending thirty warm emails and thirty cold emails, and you're keeping your volume really low per inbox. And if you want to scale your volume, tools like Instant Lead, tools like Smart Lead allow you to add as many inboxes without charging any more or charging additional costs, and it rotates through those inboxes. That's how you want to scale in today's time when it comes to email campaign performance because it's the best way put forward. And then when it comes to the warm-up duration, I prefer to kind of warm up my inboxes for 7 to 14 days prior to launching a campaign. And when I launch the campaign, I like to ramp up the volume at a gradual pace. So that's everything that you need to keep in mind when it comes to warm up. Now let's talk about email copy. So with email copy, you want to make sure that your text is plain text. You want to make sure that you don't include any links and that if you're doing a signature that you're not including images in your signatures and a ton of different links. And the main reason why is it's just because it adds more technical debt to your email, right? There's a lot of email servers out there at bigger companies that if a recipient outside of their organization is sending an email and it has links, it has attachments, it will simply not let it to be received by the receiver. And so keep it plain text, you're gonna see that you have better inbox placement 99% of the time. And when it comes to emails, you need to have what is called spin tax. And so spin tax is basically taking a sentence, changing up the content in the sentence, but keeping the overall meaning the same. And so think of it from Google or Microsoft's point of view. If they have a user that's sending the same exact email over and over and over again, they're gonna think that it's spam, right? And so you wanna spin different variations in your email without changing the overall meaning of your email to increase your chances of having great inbox placement. So in this example right here, this is my favorite way of adding spit tax. I like to spin the greeting spin the close and then if you're using ai lines ai lines will technically be considered a version of spin tax because it's you know adding a different variation for every single recipient on your lead list and i like to actually add a quote so this is a secret tactic that we've been using that's helped us a lot so think about it when someone sends a cold email nobody puts a quote like a motivational quote a part of their signature so you know first you're looking a little bit more human and it may look like, you know, your email is just coming just straight off of someone that's sending it right out of their inbox. And you're able to spin all these different quotes. So every email has a different quote. So you're once again creating more variations within your cold email campaigns, which is going to help your inbox placement. And so if you kind of look at these pictures, you'll see that the email is spinning the greeting, it's spinning the closing, and it's adding a different quote. And you'll see that it does it right here again. Different greeting, a different closing, a different quote. And so we're creating more variations to kind of trick the system. And so that's how you want to think about email copy. Now let's talk about sending pattern and platform settings. So like I mentioned earlier, you do want to make sure that your cold emails are not just immediately blasting out emails every single day as soon as you create the inbox. You want to slowly ramp up the inboxes. And, you know, I don't think it really matters like what is that daily rate of change or what is... Like, like how it scales, I think you just need to have some level of ramp up in your process. And then when it comes to the actual bounce rate of your campaign, you need to make sure that the bounce rate is always under 4% at the bare minimum. I honestly prefer to have it under 2%. And you know, this, you gotta think about it, right? Google and Microsoft 
a normal user is not getting a lot of bounces because they're emailing people that they know within their organizations or friends and families or coworkers of some sort, right? And so if they see a campaign is getting a lot of bounces, they're going to start to get a little suspicious. And so this is like kind of a silent killer of email deliverability that I see a lot of people mess up on. So you want to make sure that your bounce rate is below 4%. If it jumps above 4%, pause the campaign, go clean your lead list again, and you know upload the, the leads that are coming back as unverified or invalid, and add them to your DNC. That's the quickest way to kind of remediate solutions like that. When it comes to inbox management, so this is where I see a lot of people mess up. So the number one thing that's going to hurt your email campaign performance is people legitimately marking your email as spam, right? And so most people don't do that. They'll reply to your email and just say, hey, take me off your list, unsubscribe, or whatever it is, right? And most people typically will just kind of, most sales engagement platforms, if you reply to the message, it'll stop all the messages coming out afterwards. And so then they'll just kind of leave it. But you want to actively get into a process where you're taking all the unsubscribe requests and adding it to the DNC and maintaining a good DNC. Because what happens when, you know, three months down the line, you reuse a lead list or you scrape a lead list and somehow that contact is on that lead list and you email them again. They're probably going to remember you, they're probably going to hate you, and they're probably going to mark your email as spam. So you want to make sure that you're properly managing your inbox when it comes to that, that inbox management piece and adding all the people that say remove you off your list, unsubscribe to your DNC. And then, like I said, when it comes to the sender limit, Keep your total volume low per inbox and scale with multiple inboxes using platforms like Smartly, Instantly, or any. And then you don't want to track opens. It just, like I said before, same thing with the links. It just adds technical debt to your cold email, which, you know, will hurt your performance. And open rates, it's not even a good indication when it comes to, to deliverability, right? You can't control your open rates. You can control your inbox placement. And then with blacklist, you know, a lot of people always freak out about blacklist. But with blacklist, like there's only three that you really have to worry about. And they're honestly kind of hard to get onto. SEMrush, Barracuda, and SpamCop. But there's a lot of other blacklists that really don't do anything to your reputation. So don't freak out about it. If you do one of those blacklist checkers that you see that you're on something like Swords, it does nothing to your actual reputation. And so don't worry about it. Um, the only way to kind of get off of these uh, really powerful blacklists is kind of doing the remediation process, which is typically kind of long and, and kind of not worth it. It's usually easier, quicker to just spin up more domains and more inboxes and, and running it that way. And so that's all the stuff that we kind of practice and follow when it comes to deliverability. And typically, if we follow everything that I kind of went through there, you're never going to really have to worry about inbox placement for the most part and deliverability. But let's say, you know, we are following all of this and for some reason our deliverability is still suffering. The best way to know if your deliverability is actually suffering is not through your open rates, it's doing inbox placement tests, right? So like I said before, you can't control your open rates, but what you can control to a certain degree is your inbox placement. And this is a true indication of deliverability. So basically what you're doing with inbox placement tests is taking a list of seed accounts that some provider owns and you're emailing them. And they're basically tracking where your email goes within those accounts, right? And there's a free one through Inboxy. And all you have to do is literally send an email to find at myips.io with the account that you're wanting to test and then follow the prompt and it's going to tell you where your emails landed. If you're all in the inbox, you got nothing to worry about. You're doing great. There's another version called Mail Monitor. Uh, it is paid and it is also really great. This is more premium. Their team is super, super smart when it comes to deliverability. Uh, I'm, I'm really great friends with their CEO, Adrian. Adrian, I can't remember his last name. I might be saying that wrong. Uh, and, and he's he's absolutely incredible when it comes to deliverability. If I have questions, he knows the answer. Um, he's super intelligent. He's studied email deliverability for you know ten plus years. Then the other two on the market is Glock Apps, and this is probably the most commonly used one. And truthfully, it is not accurate at all. And so you know, at one point of my cold email career, I strictly believe that I could never inbox within Outlook accounts and my inbox placement with Outlook, Outlook accounts was 100% going to spam. And then I kind of took a step back and I thought to myself, I am using a brand new domain with a brand new inbox. There's no reason why 100% of my emails that are going to Outlook would be going to spam. It just doesn't make any sense. And we did manual tests because we have a ton of Outlook accounts. I would email my Outlook accounts and they would go to primary every single time. And so I knew from there that Block Apps is probably not most most reliable tool. And you know these things are always changing, right? And so 
you kind of want to look at all these different points that I set. And if you're following all of these different points, for the most part, your deliverability is going to be fine. And you want to kind of use multiple sources to test and, and identify if you actually have email deliverability issues. So that's basically the entire video. I've covered the five most common things that we'll do to manage our deliverability when it comes to cold emails.